Uh, First Approach is, is, is my baby. It's my company. Um, we started uh, in October of 2014. Uh, developed a plan uh, to teach first aid and CPR and, and EMS programs. Uh, I've been an EMT uh, going on 29 years now. First Approach prides itself on in-person learning and in-person skill sessions. Um, we do not do the online learning um, instruction for our EMS programs. We teach EMR, which is emergency medical responder courses. We teach the EMT courses, which is the emergency medical technician, which most people heard about. And these are all stepping stones to the paramedic programs or further. We've had students that have, sit, have sat in these chairs and have gone on to nursing. Uh, we have a couple students in med school right now. Uh, we have a student that uh, was in our classes that uh, is an anesthesiologist right now. Uh, OT, PT, respiratory therapy. Um, runs the gamut on what you can do as starting uh, in a career uh, in EMS. So First Approach um, also teaches first aid and CPR courses. We, we work through American Heart Association and also Red Cross. Uh, one of our busiest times of the year is, is uh, May and June, uh, working with about 25 summer camps, getting them up and running um, and accredited for um, their new counselors coming on board. Twice a year, we also run a wilderness first aid course, uh, which is um, a mandatory requirement for Boy Scouts that go on their trips out west Every February, we do a heart safe, free CPR event. A couple times a year, we also run a pet first aid and CPR class. Uh, we do actually have dog mannequins. We run a full, full gamut of courses. Uh, one of the courses also that we run is mental health first aid. We run that through the National Behavioral Council. What do you necessarily think like the average person or someone that doesn't work in this field gets wrong about what you guys do on a daily basis? So I think the biggest misconception is that when an ambulance arrives, the patient and the patient's family expect us to load the patient in the ambulance and then whisk them away to the hospital lights and sirens. And that doesn't always happen because there's so many um, procedures that we can do on scene and in the ambulance and then take the patient to the hospital. Uh, especially when we have a paramedic on board. If we need a paramedic for a higher level of care, there's not too many things that the paramedic can't do that the ER can't do. So if we can stabilize the patient on scene in the ambulance, then we can take an easier ride to the hospital. So a requirement of the class is that students have to demonstrate competency while completing practical skill stations without coaching assistance, whether it be from the instructors or from the other students in the class. They must demonstrate that they can pass each one of those stations at least three times prior to taking their final practical exam. The stations include CPR, airway, medical, which is the students and the instructor go through an entire scenario from start to finish, bleeding control, long bone immobilization, as well as joint immobilization. So our ideal compression rate is 100 beats a minute. So if we go back to Star Wars, the Imperial March, <laughs> that is 100 beats a minute. You know the song? No. All right. I'm not gonna lie to you, I know the song, I don't know the song. It's all good. You know Staying Alive? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There you go, mm -hmm. 100 beats a yeah. minute. Okay. So that's our compression rate. So every, 30, every, every beat on that, we're gonna go down. And our goal is to push down two inches, okay. give or take. You're not going to push too far, all right? Okay. So that's your rate. You're staying alive. Yeah. Go for it. And we're going to do 30 compressions. CPR is one of those skills that you can literally, they, they talk you through it on a phone when you call 911. And we're going to take our, our hands, we're going to interlock our fingers. We're going to put one palm on top of the other. And we're going to go right down on the, the middle bone in between the nipples. And we're going to push. We're gonna push hard, we're gonna push fast. Okay. So we have two different types of CPR that we can do. We can do professional CPR, which is what we're teaching these guys here, or we can do a lay person CPR, which is Joe Schmo on the street. Hey, I'm Joe Schmo. Joe Schmo on the street, all you do is push on the chest. Okay. All you have to do. The body has enough oxygen left in it, and it's not really using a lot of it, that the only, the only portion we're actually moving blood around in when we do CPR is basically from the ears to the nipples. Okay. It's as far as we're pushing blood, right? As we do professional CPR, after our first 30 seconds, we would bag the patient, right? So when we, when we bag the patient, we're gonna use a BVM, a bag valve mask, positive pressure, 
and it's relatively simple. We have a triangular mask. Okay. We're going to take the triangle. We're going to put right on the bridge of the nose in between the eyes. Okay. We drop this back down. We can hold this in place. And all I'm going to do is pull the bottom of the mask up into the, pull the bottom of the chin up into the mask, and I can bang, and the chest goes up and down. So the goal is we do 30 compressions, bag twice, 30 compressions, bag twice. We do that for a total of five rounds. Okay. Or a total of two minutes. Okay. And then we would either reassess our patient, check for our pulses again, make sure our breathing is okay or not okay. If the breathing is not okay or the pulses aren't there, we keep going. If our AED shows up or some other rescuers show up, we would go straight into putting the AED on, shock them. One of our airway mannequins uh, that we teach with, and like I said earlier, um, all the equipment that we use in class is, is real, the same equipment you would use in the field. Um, so for instance, this is a BVM, a bag valve mask um, that we, what we use in the field. The oxygen tanks um, that we use in class uh, all have oxygen in them, and so, so the students get to you really use uh, oxygen tanks with oxygen in them. The other equipment I'm gonna demo uh, is an oral airway. I'm gonna put this in the patient's mouth, keep the tongue back, keep that airway open. And then another piece of equipment is our suction. This is a portable suction. Um, this is one of the catheters that we use. So this would be a, a suction unit that we would take in the patient's home if we needed to. Uh, the ambulance has its own uh, inboard suction. Another airway I'll show you is a, uh, a nasal airway. Uh, this goes up the nasal passage. Um, if the patient has like a gag reflex that we can't put an oral airway in, we would use a, um, a nasal airway. Many times we'll use a nasal airway for someone suffering from uh, overdose, like an opioid overdose, where we need to maintain an airway, uh, but we, they still have a gag reflex. We need to support their breathing. So this mannequin um, shows the student, once it works, um, how, how, how good of a breath they're getting in uh, to, to the victim's uh, mouth and airway. So the two lungs are here. Uh, the stomach is here. So what we don't want to see is the stomach inflate. We just want to see the lungs inflate. So students will learn in the course, obviously, how to hold everything. Um, and obviously, we teach on a table to begin with, but most of our scenarios are on the ground because that's where our victim usually is. Not too many people uh, are sick on a table. So what we do is we show them how to hold and give breaths so that our lungs um, actually inflate. All right, so we checked the back of the neck for our, tracheal DB, or for our step off or deformity. We came across to the front of the neck, we checked for jugular vein distension. Okay. And then we checked for trachea being midline. All right. After that, we can actually put a C collar on the patient, properly size it, put it on the patient, and that will take care of their neck. That's the All neck right. brace so thing. That's the neck brace, so it, it helps them not to move their neck and helps us when we have to move the patient. Okay. After that, we go down the chest. So we would want to pull the shirt up so that we can expose it. We want to see what the chest looks like. We want to make sure that it's intact. And we, we literally, we step down the whole chest, pushing every piece. What we're looking for is making sure the bones are intact. At the bottom, we want to make sure that when they breathe, both sides come up and come down at the same time and the same rate. Okay. All right, because we want to make sure that there's not an injury on one side of the chest versus the other. Okay, it's a good time to check lung sounds. And then we go down to the belly. We want to check all four quadrants with a deep palpation. What we're looking for is any type of painful response or any type of rigidity or, or hardness to the belly itself. That would tell us that we have some type of belly injury, maybe internal bleeding. After that, we go down to the pelvis. And we're gonna grab the hips. And we're gonna push in gently and pull down gently. And what we're looking for is to make sure that doesn't move. If the pelvis moves around and becomes unstable in front of us, then we have some type of pelvic injury. Right? There's a, a single point where we check the groin, making sure there's no bleeding or anything in that area. And then we start going down the individual limbs. So we start up way high in the legs and we encircle the entire leg and step down, touching every piece of it all the way down to the ankle, making sure that all the bones are intact and there's no holes or bleeding process that's happening. So once we go down each leg, now we're down at the feet, we can check for what we call PMS or pulse, motor, and sensory. So I wanna know that each one of your feet has a pulse that I can palpate. I want to know that each one of your feet has sensation. Can you feel me? And I want to know that the patient can wiggle their toes and move their feet. Okay. All right, the wiggling of the toes tells me that they're neurologically intact. Their brain talks to their feet. Their sensation lets me know the feet talk to the brain. 
and the pulses let me know that we actually have distal circulation or circulation throughout the entire body. Okay. Studio question. Where would you look for a pulse on a, on your So we have two places. We have a, oh, we call it dorsalis pedis, which is right on the top of the foot, kind of where your hair grows. Okay. Right? A little bit difficult to find. And then there's another one right behind the ankle. Oh, okay. That works out pretty well. So it wasn't a stupid question then? No, not at all. I would have thought it was behind your calf for some reason. No. All right, so we've done the legs. We're going to come up and we're going to do the arms the exact same way. Okay. So we start high in the arms. We work our way all the way down. And that will leave us right at the hands. So we can do our PMS or our pulse motor and sensory in the hands. Same as you would with Same the... as we did in the feet. Okay. Right? That, and once we've done that, we've checked everything on the anterior or the front of the body. The only thing left for us to do is to roll the patient. Check and when we roll down. the patient, we have our partner already at the head. So when we roll, we will always go on the head's count because we want the head and the body to move as one unit. So when we roll the body, we're, we're working with the head person. All right? And it's really the head person that's going to say, okay, on the count of three or on the count of one or whatever they're doing to make that movement happen. So as they move the head, we're going to grab the shoulders and the hip and move the body in the same manner. And what we're doing is just rotating them up 90 degrees so that we can check the back. Okay. All right, so heads count, we can roll the body, bring them on up, and then we can check the back the same way that we check the neck. All right, so we would literally start at the, at the top and work our way down touching every bone that's in the back, okay. all the way down the spine. Check and again, we're looking for that right. step off or deformity. Okay. All right, making sure that the spine is intact. Yep. And then we go down and we just check the butt, making sure we don't have any massive bleeding or injuries to the, to the butt. And after that, we roll them back down onto a backboard or some form of transportation, and we can take them to the hospital. Okay. After that, we've, we've touched every portion of the body, which means that we should have found any hidden injuries that we, that we didn't know about before. All right. It also gives us an opportunity now we can treat any of those injuries that we found. Cool. Cool? Cool. All right. Thank you. Any other advice you want to share or anything you else you would like people to know about working in the um, EMS field, the medical field? I'm passionate about EMS. Um, I, I think that people need to understand what we do um, the, and how adaptable we are in the field. And the validation that, that we get and, and I get as an instructor is not if someone passes the course. My validation is when somebody, you know, gets a job or volunteers for their town and does something good. Um, and that's what, that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm here for. I want, I want someone to go out in their community, help somebody that's in need and, and do a good job. We teach two things in this course, competency and confidence.